Welcome to the Story Church Podcast. My name is Jason, and I'm so glad you are here. Thank you for taking time out of your day to listen. If you're new and this is your first time here with us, I really hope you find your time with us meaningful. We would love to meet you and get to know you. And you can find a couple of ways to do that on our website at storiedchurch.org at storied, S-T-O-R-I-E-D, church.org, or you can find us on social media, and we would love for you to follow us on Instagram and or Facebook at Storied Church. We hope that our sermons and our ruminations are thoughtful and meaningful reflections that help us take our next steps together on our journey. Enjoy. Quinn Rank is a dedicated community leader, council member for the town of Elon, North Carolina. Any of my Elon people here? Woo-hoo! All right, yeah. Elon University here. All right. Um, a graduate of UNC Greensboro. Okay. <laughs> Uh, he drives economic growth through his work in local restaurants and as a risk management advisor. Uh, we work with him for our uh, liability insurance at Story Church. Um, uh, he's active in community service. Quinn serves on the economic development and arts committees, leading initiatives for improved infrastructure, public transportation, and diversity. Proud father and volunteer wrestling coach, which is awesome. And he's committed to enhancing the quality of life for all residents. So welcome, Quinn. So come take a seat. So first, thank you for uh, for doing this. Um, it, it does mean the world to us as a as a community. Um, and as I've, I've shared with folks that um, we've reached out to most leaders say yes. Uh, uh, but some leaders say, you know, I'm really not comfortable coming into a church space on Sunday. Do you have other times? And I'm just like, this is the time when like the majority of people gather for us. And so thank you for taking. Yeah, for sure. It's my um, pleasure. Yeah. So that's awesome. So first, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do and kind of what has brought you to this moment in your life. Well, it's um, really a, an honor to be called a leader because it's, I guess I see myself as that, but I'm also, I'm, I'm just a dude. Um, I'm, I'm a husband, I'm a dad, um, I'm a believer in everything Tadas. Um, it's this is kind of what I, what I do. Um, but I also, I, I believe in compassion and empathy and respect and love. And I think, you know, we all play a part in that to help better our community, no matter how big or how small that may be. And so it kind of just led me into, um, getting into this political realm. I started out growing up with uh, always going to the polls with my parents, going to go vote. Uh, my grandparents always volunteered and were poll workers. So the election was really, or politics was really big. I, you know, I was the kid going to school with Bill Clinton buttons as like a first grader. That's just, my, my parents kind of put that uh, out there. But then um, uh, I had some restaurants in downtown Elon, the Root and Tangent, and I started going to the, just the local merchant meetings and being involved in town hall, and I knew through the restaurants that I was creating a place where people could feel safe. I mean, everybody loves to eat. We always like, we talk about breaking bread together, and that's a place everybody would make memories and could be together and have a community. And so then the town actually came to me and was like, hey, you'd make a great uh, council member and or alderman at the time. And I wasn't really aware. It wasn't in my purview to go be a council member and to get into politics. And next thing you know, I paid my $5 at the Board of Elections and I, I got to go run for office. Uh, so I started knocking on doors, started meeting people. And it really didn't hit me until 2020, just got elected in 19. And, you know, this was right after George Floyd's murder. And I went to a, a rally down in North Park and I was hanging around with former Mayor Ian Baltudis. And at the time, you know, I was just going there to see what was happening and to show support and solitude. And they uh, asked all the local elected officials to come up and speak. And I, I didn't, Ian starts walking. I didn't move. And Ian's like, no, come on, Quinn, you got to you got to say something. And so that, that's when it kind of really hit me. Um, but then I also blame it on um, Elaine Berry um, quite a bit to, to where I am now and in, into the leadership of the political realm, because I didn't realize how much power a local leader had. 
and then meeting her when she was um, the chair of the, the local party and uh, working uh, with Ricky Hurtado on, on his campaign. It just really showed uh, that there are people out there that can make a difference and w- wants to do good uh, through the elected level. Uh, so today we are discussing uh, with us, among us, I think something really important. I think uh, you embody this in, in some ways. Um, uh, how old are your kids? I have a six-year-old, Addie, and then I have a almost three-year-old, Scarlett. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I can relate. Um <clears throat> So, you know, in most parents, uh, we are stressed out and the calendar is full. Um, And sometimes that we can come to the conclusion of what kind of impact am I able. I mean, I think parents in general right now feel like before kids, it's like I can make an impact or I did my job well. And like during, especially when kids are young, it's like I struggling to get the laundry done. Um, and if we can begin to like doubt ourselves in our, in our agency to believe that we can make a difference, um, for you as, as a parent, as with a young family, um, how did you find that agency and belief? Like, even like, you know, I know there's probably something in us going like leader. I don't know about that at this point in my life. Like what's the good, the bad, the ugly to all of that. And like believing in yourself that you can make a positive impact at this stage of life. Man, that's, that's a question that I struggle with constantly. Um, you know, thank God for, for my wife, um, and for the dryer cause the dryer holds our clothes quite often. Um, but, but, uh, you know, it's, it's something that, um, at, at first when you, when you're getting into it, you don't realize how much time it takes and I've, I've learned a bunch of different methods and pathways uh, to, to this. Um, one is to find a partner that believes in you and believes in the mission and is willing to, uh, we both make sacrifices. And so to help sacrifice and then, you know, whenever there's a, an argument of like, man, I've got to, got to go do this. And she's like, I don't know if you can. I'm like, it's for democracy. And, and, and it's really hard to argue that, right? Um, but really... Um, and, and I've got my kids now because it, it is tough. A- Addie's getting older, and, you know, some nights I do come home later because I, I work a nine-to-five job, and then right after work I've got to go to this meeting or do this. And so what I have found is, and this is going to sound crazy, we, we do all understand that in politics and that being an elected official, that is where you are going to change policy, right? You're going to need people in office that can change for the better, for the good. But the longer I've done this... The more I realize and the more people I've met, you don't have to be an elected official to better your community, you know, and that's something that has helped me pull back some because in the beginning, you know, I was uh, the communications chair for the NAACP, started the local chapter here. Um, I was working in other organizations and groups, and I knew I had to dial some back so I could be more with my family, but it's also been really cool because now my family gets to come along on this journey with me. And they understand, like, Addie loved knocking on doors this past election with me. It also makes it easier for somebody to open the door when you have a cute kid with you opposed to just me. Um, So I've struggled with where where do I find the change? And I've started realizing I don't need to go out there swinging big. Like, when I first got elected the the first year in office, I was like, I'm going to come in here and make a big difference. And I brought to the board, like, we're going to have a non-discrimination ordinance, right? Like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do this right out the gate. And I had more faith, more optimism in my, in my fellow colleagues on the board, but I got shut down real quick. And uh, it humbled me. It was like, man, this is going to be a tougher avenue. So I started realizing just taking the small wins, just meeting people, understanding that like my little marble that I throw into the pond will make waves and just being a good person. Um, and when I see that, when I see that my kids understand it and my wife understands it, and then my friends and people around and getting invited to something like this, um, that pebble is making that difference because I am being seen as a leader and being told that I embody things. And, um, that's just, thank you for the reassurance. Um, but really, you know, it's just the the small wins, take the small gratitudes. Yep. Thank you. Um, this is the, uh, I think for me, this is like the question that is really, really important, especially like for people who see the world differently, uh, opposite political parties, 
Uh, has there been a moment when a constituent has convinced you of something maybe you disagreed with and that possibly changed your mind in terms of a policy decision? Um, so, I.e., as a political leader, do you listen to people, I guess? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you, you sent me these questions earlier in the week, and I was thinking about it, and I was like, man, I can't just come in here and say no. Um, like that, <laughs> that's, that's not how, how it works. Um, but, but then uh, something that, that has, and I was trying to think of an example, because when you knock on doors, a lot of people don't understand what the city council does, and they're like, I don't want Democrats to take my guns. Um, and it's like, well, the, this, this isn't it, you know, and then... Um, so I was like, what, what, has, what has been a thing that has changed uh, me? And this is really getting into the minutia of things, and it's going to be like land development ordinances that we're talking about. But in our 2040 Elon Envision, and I think everybody's community, we want to have more connectivity. We want to have more bike paths, more uh, sidewalks. We want to be able to connect to other communities. Well, Gibsonville, our neighbor, right on the line, they decided to put a development together. And this development was going to connect to Elon uh, in one of these Elon neighborhoods. And the residents of any time you put up new development, everybody hates it, right? Like you buy your house, you don't get it. Their kids are going to get hit by a car. Their dog or cat's going to get hit. There's going to be more traffic. That's always the argument. So this Elon development didn't want the connectivity to their development. And I'm for it, right? I think connectivity brings diversity. It brings people together. And I really had to, like, change my thought because there's a new development coming that it's not going to be for the tax base of Elon. They're going to be riding on our roads. And these uh, neighbors that voted for me really, really, really didn't want it, even though I really didn't think that's the best idea. Um, But, yeah, so so I, I listened and changed it. Had it been an Elon development connecting to another Elon development, we can get into some state legislative rules that wouldn't allow us to say no to this. But since it was another uh, community, another municipality, we we were allowed to say no. And so that that was really tough for me to to say no because I don't want to think I'm smarter than thou or better than them. Or but the residents really didn't want it, and even though I thought it was silly, I you know they elected me. That's what they wanted me to do is protect their neighborhood, and so that's what I did. Great, great. Uh, my last question is, um, if you had a, a freebie to make any change, um, like you were trying to do at the beginning of your, your council uh, uh, vocation, um, what, would that, what would that freebie, freebie be? Yeah, so that, that, that's another good question, Jason. I, uh, was I stole it from this. someone. It's, it's, it's a great one because, uh, I mean, you know, we can swing for the fences here. And then I was like, well, maybe they're only thinking, you know, what, what can I do in my political role? Because, you know, I, I would love to have health care for all. I would love to have free lunches for everybody and, you know, spend more money on uh, funding education. But that's not really in my respect of my, my position. Yeah. Yeah. So what could I do? And it, I kind of hinted on it earlier, but, yeah, it would be right now to just drop in and say, you know, we can have a non-discrimination ordinance in the town of Elon. Um, because right now it's not protected federally, right? You know, and that one of the examples I used uh, quite often was when I had the restaurants, I could literally, and it's anybody, any restaurant or any establishment that has under 15 employees, because right now the, the we all heard of the Colorado Cakes case that happened, um, and this, this is where the Supreme Court ruled, where any uh, establishment under 15 employees, um, they don't have to follow this discrimination ordinance. So, like, you know, we could have a, a gay couple walk into the, the restaurant and you could slur them as much as you wanted to and say you're not served them, and nothing happens. And that's, you know, I don't think there's any establishments too many like that in Elon, or if any. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not going to come. If there's a four-way stop with no stop signs, you don't wait till there's crashes to, to implement things. And so that, that would be mine. I would put up a non-discrimination ordinance right. um, to just show, you know, I don't want a virtue signal. I think it can stop things uh, from happening. We know that works. If we look at the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it, it, it's not going to stop people from being racist and discriminatory, but it's going to hold people accountable to, to their actions. And uh, so that, that, that would be mine. I would have a non-discrimination ordinance right in the town. So really, really quick to, to follow up on that, um, which I, I imagine there's absolutely no, very little support for something like that here in Mebane, but what would be the, um, what's the resistance? Like, that just seems like... It seems like a no-brainer, um, and now that I understand it more, um, un- understand how local government works and staff. So at, when it first got 
the no vote, um, I was just outnumbered in people's thought processes, right? And then we weren't sharing the same values on the board, and so it was a, a 4 1 vote very quick. Um, but then um, now, I think there was, I think it, we have a more progressive of a board. It's the staffing of how you implement it, right? Of ha- how that happens. So let's say this, the situation I described, happened. Well, who decides that it was discriminatory? Um, we have a white town manager. Um, we did put together a board, uh, a straight white manager, but we did put together a um, diversity, equity, and belonging committee. It was like, well, maybe they hear the case and decide to do it. There just seemed like there was a lot of steps in between of determining and who's going to determine it, if we have the staff to determine it. Um, but we're still in the process of trying to move forward with that because I think the last thing we want is one person deciding if that was discriminatory or not, especially that person not being an elected. Great. Well, thank you, Quinn. And I uh, really appreciate you being here and, yeah, and visiting I, I really, with us. Yeah, ab- absolutely. This is awesome. And uh, I saw up there, we'll, we'll be at Pride as well. It's October 5th. I saw, oh, it's uh, wrong, wrong It was like uh, Saturday, October I like to 2nd. mess with people here. Yeah. Well, yeah. well I, I do as well, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't do a plug. Um, just like uh, any other mediocre white guy, we, we started a podcast. Um, it's called the uh, the Hometown Holler. Um, we have like nineteen thousand plus uh, listeners and subscribers. Uh, we're the one of the largest independent political uh, podcasts in the state. We call it Tar Hill Politics in the Shot Glass, uh, and we've interviewed Jeff Jackson. We've interviewed Jessica Holmes, most all of the Council of the State candidates right now, and then also local leaders um, and local nonprofits. We've had Kristen Powers on there uh, talking about Benevolence Farms. I know she's a friend of Story Church here. And we'll also be at Pride, so you can stop by and, and check us out. Awesome. Thank you, Quinn. Appreciate it. Again, we want to thank you for listening today to the Story Church podcast. We really hope that we get to meet you soon. And uh, again, you can visit us at storiedchurch.org, or you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. We hope that you have a wonderful week. Hi, everyone. It's Jason again. And uh, before you go today, uh, I just wanted to just take one moment of your time. Um, Maybe you are a regular tender at Story Church or uh, somebody that has found our podcast and you're just listening and uh, you find it valuable. Um. I just want to ask a huge favor. Um, Our church is located in North Carolina, Alamance County, and we are one of the only um, open and affirming, reconciling, progressive, whatever word you want to label on that church here in Alamance County. Um, And so we're just a a really important voice of hope uh, in this place. Every organization, including ours, uh, takes funding, and uh, the church is changing, so we're trying to um, be creative in our funding. Um, but I know it's a different ask, that, especially if you don't live here in North Carolina. But if you would support us or consider supporting us with a one-time gift or even a monthly gift, it would mean the world. And, um, and, and thank you so much for even considering Um, You can give by going to storychurch.org backslash give. I hope you do. We would love your partnership and your friendship. Thanks again.